Every March 31st, the US Virgin Islands of St. Thomas, St. John and St. Croix observe Transfer Day to commemorate their sale from Denmark to the United States that carried a $612 million price tag in today's money. Of the US's five permanently inhabited territories, the Virgin Islands are unique as the only ones purchased from another imperial power. The US and Denmark negotiated over the islands for over 50 years, finally transferring power in 1917. So why was the US interested in taking over these three small islands? Well, to answer that, we first need to understand the foundations upon which American geopolitical power is built. With war raging in the Middle East, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is showing no sign of stopping, and increased talk of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the US has its eyes focused solely on the geopolitics of Eurasia, with little interest in what's going on in its own backyard. It seems that much of modern US geopolitical thinking, such as the works of former National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski, is influenced by British geographer Sir Halford J. McKinder's Heartland thesis. The thesis warned that a power dominating Eurasia's heartland was the key to world geopolitical domination. According to him, the coming vast networks of railroads worldwide would eclipse seaborne trade. Time has ultimately proved Mackinder wrong, however. While Eurasia is in many ways the center of global affairs, seaborne trade is still king, and controlling the world's oceans is key to geopolitical primacy. America's current geopolitical and economic supremacy of the world's oceans and thus, world trade is rooted in its domination of a key region, the Caribbean Basin, the American Mediterranean, the seed from which American naval power grew. According to American geostrategist George Friedman, since its founding, the United States has harbored a fear of European involvement in North America and the Western Hemisphere. The US initially focused on cementing the union between states and protecting against European powers like the British and the French on the American continent. President George Washington's 1796 farewell address advised against European entanglements, emphasizing the protection afforded by geographic distance. Throughout the 19th century, the US expanded westward, acquiring territories through purchases, annexations, and wars, including the Louisiana and Alaska purchases and the conquest of territory from Native Americans in Mexico, securing its continental borders against European powers. Even before the US secured its modern-day borders, it had the ambition to evict European power from its continent through the bold Monroe Doctrine of 1823, declaring European attempts to extend their influence in the Western Hemisphere threats to US peace and safety. While continentalism did not mean isolationism, the US engaged in limited international actions, such as the Barbary Wars, the Treaty of Friendship with Hawaii, and opening Japan to trade. However, it remained firmly focused on ensuring it was the top dog in its neighborhood. A significant shift occurred with the Spanish-American War in 1898. The US crushed what remained of Madrid's power in the Western Hemisphere, leading to the acquisition of Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, and Hawaii. Influenced by Alfred Thayer Mayen's ideas on naval power, who contrasted Mackinder and believed it superior to land power, the US began projecting power globally through its navy exemplified by Roosevelt's Great White Fleet's voyage around the world in 1909. The Roosevelt Corollary of 1904 expanded the Monroe Doctrine under President Theodore Roosevelt, justifying US intervention in Latin America and the Caribbean to maintain stability and order, effectively positioning the US as a regional police force. Completing the Panama Canal in 1914 further solidified U.S. military and economic strategy by providing a crucial maritime route that enhanced U.S. naval mobility and commercial interests. World War I marked a clear break from Washington's isolationist advice. German submarine warfare and the Zimmermann telegram prompted U.S. entry into the war, emphasizing the need to protect its interests and reassert the Monroe Doctrine. During this period, our story of the purchase of the US Virgin Islands culminated. So we've established that the Caribbean is important to US geostrategy. But now we need to know why. According to journalist and geopolitics author Robert D. Kaplan, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was a key region for Washington foreign policy professionals, much like the Middle East today. The Greater Caribbean, including the Gulf of Mexico, spans approximately 1,500 miles in one direction and 1,000 miles in the other, making it comparable in size to the South China Sea. 
a region so often in the news due to ongoing US-China tensions around Taiwan. Just as the South China Sea is central to the Indo-Pacific region, the Greater Caribbean can be seen as the American Mediterranean, central to the Western Hemisphere. Once the United States came to dominate the Greater Caribbean, it effectively mirrored Roman control of the Mediterranean, the foundation upon which Roman imperial power stemmed. This geographical advantage left the United States with few challenges in its own hemisphere. Subsequently, it provided the US with the resources to influence the balance of power in the Eastern Hemisphere. This strategy progression, first securing the Greater Caribbean and then extending influence globally, has been the bedrock upon which American power is built. So, where do these three islands we talked about come into it? Their purchase was another chapter in the story of the gradual US conquest of the Caribbean. Due to the transatlantic slave trade and sugar production, the Caribbean was immensely important to the global economy during the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. European powers like Spain, Britain, France and the Netherlands engaged in numerous wars to win control over key islands like Jamaica, Haiti and Cuba and the bountiful resources that came with their control. Although small, Denmark was able to wield a formidable navy for its size and thus was also able to get in on the game of Caribbean conquest. In 1622, Copenhagen merchants sought permission from King Christian IV to establish a West Indian trading company, but initial interest waned due to the failure of other trading companies in the apocalyptic Thirty Years' War, to which Denmark was a major party. It wasn't until Eric Smith's successful private expedition in 1652 that interest was renewed, leading to a formal proposal to settle St. Thomas in 1665. Early attempts at colonization faced numerous challenges, including storms, illness, privateer attacks and hurricanes, leading to the initial Connolly's collapse. The Danish West India Company was established in 1671, chartered by King Christian V and successfully settled in St. Thomas in 1672. Despite significant losses during transit and in the first year, the Connolly persisted. The Danes expanded to St. John in 1718 and purchased St. Croix from the French West India Company in 1733. By 1754, the islands were sold to the Danish king, Frederick V, becoming royal Danish colonies. The islands also became bases for pirates and the centre of conflict between the Brandenburg African Company and between the Spanish and Scottish over territorial claims. Denmark weathered these storms, however, and retained control of the islands. The 19th century saw the end of the slave trade in the Caribbean. The successful Haitian Revolution, which led to the creation of the first Black Republic and involved brutal reprisals against their former colonial masters, spooked many slave owners throughout the region. In addition, the growth of the sugar trade in countries like India, now also a battleground between European powers, led to a decline in the region's profitability. A significant revolt in the Danish West Indies in 1848 led to the abolition of slavery in the colony. In the mid-19th century, the islands were experiencing economic decline, making them increasingly costly for the Danish government to manage. By the late 19th century, Denmark found it costly to maintain the islands. At the same time, the US eyed them as a strategic asset for economic and national security reasons, fearing a hostile foreign power might take control and use them as a bridgehead against American power. American interest in the islands had actually preceded the Spanish-American War and the building of the Panama Canal. Beginning in 1876, the United States made multiple attempts to expand its influence in the Caribbean by acquiring the Danish West Indies. In 1867, President Andrew Johnson's Secretary of State, William Henry Seward, sought to acquire the islands as part of his vision for peaceful territorial expansion and nearly secured the acquisition of St. Thomas and St. John in 1867 for $7.5 million, with local approval via a plebiscite. He successfully negotiated a treaty ratified by the Danish Parliament and approved through a local plebiscite with limited suffrage, allowing islanders to remain Danish subjects or become US citizens. However, the US Senate, still angered by Seward's support of President Andrew Johnson during his impeachment trial, ultimately rejected the treaty. At the same time, other politicians believed the policy was too expansionist and tried to move the US back to a more isolationist foreign policy. However, the US Senate never voted on the treaty, leading to its expiration. 
In 1900, the US and Danish governments negotiated a new treaty, which the US Senate ratified in 1902. However, the Danish parliament's upper house deadlocked in a tie vote and did not ratify the treaty. Unlike earlier attempts, the 1902 treaty did not include a plebiscite provision or grant US citizenship to the islanders. Things began to get more serious with the outbreak of World War I and the arrival of German submarine warfare. The 1915 sinking of the Lusitania spurred new debate over the US purchase of the Danish West Indies as a pressing issue in American foreign policy. President Woodrow Wilson and Secretary of State Robert Lansing were concerned that Germany might annex Denmark and secure the Danish West Indies as a naval or submarine base, from which they could launch further attacks on Caribbean and Atlantic shipping. In October 1915, Lansing approached Constantine Brun, the Danish minister to the United States, to discuss the potential purchase of the islands, but Brun initially rejected the proposal. Many Danes opposed the US acquisition of the islands, fearing that the US's poor civil rights records at the time would negatively impact the predominantly black population of the Danish West Indies. The Danish government insisted that any treaty transferring the islands would require provisions for a local plebiscite, US citizenship for the islanders, and free trade. The hard-nosed Lansing rejected these provisions, arguing that such issues fell under the jurisdiction of Congress and could not be guaranteed by treaty. They even opposed a treaty provision guaranteeing Danish citizens to their current legal rights on the island. Amidst growing concerns about the situation and Denmark's reluctance, Lansing hinted that if Denmark was unwilling to sell, the United States might occupy the island's military to prevent their seizure by Germany. Lansing's threat of seizing the islands forced Denmark to negotiate. On January 16, 1917, a treaty was signed, and on March 31st, Denmark transferred governments to the US, receiving $25 million, $612 million adjusted for inflation, in gold. The islands remain American to this day. The acquisition of the US Virgin Islands might not be as famous as the Louisiana or Alaskan purchases, but it was a well-calculated strategic move that underscored the Caribbean's importance to American geopolitical ambitions. The purchase also fit into the broader US strategy of eliminating European influence in the Western Hemisphere, as articulated in the Monroe Doctrine and reinforced by the Roosevelt Corollary. Through this acquisition, the US consolidated its dominance in the Caribbean, reducing the influence of other European powers and securing the American Mediterranean. What does the future hold for this region? American dominance in the region is now facing the first signs of challenge since the Cuban Revolution. Nicaragua is in talks with China over building a new economic waterway that would rival the Panama Canal, and a recalcitrant Venezuela flexing its muscles over Guyana. All conflicts have the potential to escalate through the involvement of Russia and China, who may also have designs on securing islands as submarine bases. So the strategic importance of the purchase of these three small islands is as important as it was in 1917.